Planar Prod presents The Attic Monologues. Episode 18, Merely Players. Narrator, Evelyn Sykes, a lover of the theatre. A bit of a short intro, but we'll go with it. Oh, right, I forgot. Hi, future Nicks. It's been a week. I'm still vibing, so I'm doing another monologue. There, uh, let's go. It ends with everything I've ever wanted, in ways I would never ask for. My final night, my ascension, the ache of my heart and the truth of my soul realized. It begins in the way most things do these days. The director brings me into a room and sits me down. He's all smiles and gentle gestures and eyes never meeting mine. He offers me tea, milk, sugar, a plate of biscuits. The nice ones from Marks and Spencer. So I know exactly what he's about to say before the words even leave his mouth. It shouldn't come as a surprise. It should never come as a surprise. It always does. I'm getting too old for the parts I play. They never say it that way, of course. They're always so kind about it. They've noticed how tired I am, how pale. I'm looking worn out. Wouldn't I prefer a break or or a role that isn't so arduous? Besides, I've been in the spotlight for such a long time. Surely it's kinder to let some young new thing take my place. Can't be selfish about these things. They phrase it in questions. It isn't one. I have one month left before they cut my strings. I have always lived upon the stage. The person behind the curtain is a hollow for my many selves. They are far more real than her. In my roles, outside myself, I am realised. I don't know why this time is different. Why it means something. I have moved between performances before, between characters. I have been my many selves. Maybe it's the character, I think. But she is no different than any other. Maybe it's the people, but they are hardly what I'd call friends. It's the theatre. This theatre, brimming with history. Its wooden floorboards, its tilted stage, its gilded arch. The red velvet of the seating and the heavy scent in the air, like old books. Every performance, I'm electrified. By the time each night is over, my heart is tattooed on the walls. My breath fills the hall like lungs. My ribs belong to the ringing of the orchestra. Each piano key, each string, is a chime of vocal cord and bone. And then I must leave. I must change and slip out through the unreal street, with red and gold flashing behind my eyes. Sometimes... I don't. Sometimes I simply can't bear it. I wait for the theatre to be cleared, for the crew to go home. I wait for them to turn the ghost light on, glowing like a beacon centre stage. Everything else is dark and quiet, but the stage is kept alive. I sit in the audience, watching it glow. I do not believe in ghosts, but I suppose that's luxury. Perhaps I have simply never seen one because the ghost light does its job correctly. Maybe I am the ghost of this theatre. One night I am sitting there. In the darkness, the ghost light calls to me. Like a moth to a flame, I would find myself standing, walking the aisle between the seats, barely aware of my own feet. No need for house lights or torches. I know each step. There is no light except the ghost light, hanging adrift above the stage. From this angle, the shadows fall just so, and I cannot even see the stand it hangs from. It appears suspended, like a star from the firmament. But no, 
blink, and there is the claw-footed iron from which it hangs. My mind has simply been turned by one too many sleepless nights. I feel as if everything will change if I can just reach the ghost light. I will figure out purpose and place. I will know what I am searching for. I will know how to stay here forever. Of course, this is the day the director forgets his wallet. He blunders into my scene like an untrained extra, interrupts me in my supplication. He sends me home with a warning, and I am certain he is ripping something from my chest when he does. My only chance to prevent my fall. But when I finally fall asleep that night, I dream. I am back in the theatre, walking the aisle from entrance to stage once more, as if I was never cast away, as if I belong. Each foot is sure in the near dark, one foot before the other. I am walking towards something, something huge and cavernous and awful and wonderful. It is just on the tip of my tongue. It is too much for me to know. It slips further away when I reach for it. There's a light in the dark, hovering above the stage. White blue light, a cold wash over my face. In the dream, there is no stand for it to hang from. It is a star. It is resolution and becoming. After this night, the director escorts me out of the theatre personally after every performance. He thinks he can keep me away, keep me detached. He thinks I am capable of leaving. But in sleep, I am returned. Each night, my star glows a little brighter. I feel a little lighter, a little larger, a little closer to becoming. By the night before my final performance, it eclipses the stage like a furnace. The whole theatre is ablaze with cold, unceasing light. But I still can't touch it. It is just beyond my reach. My feet make the journey, I climb the steps to the stage, but before I can make the final step, I wake, sweating and too warm and hollow. I'm not where I should be, where I must be. I hear the creak of wooden floorboards in my ears. I smell varnish and books. My final performance comes and goes like any other evening. A blink and we are taking our final bows. I do not cry. I think I might be incapable of it now. The rest of the cast leaves. The crew leaves. The director... Perhaps he thinks he's being kind. He lets me stay, to say goodbye. The ghost light hangs, suspended by nothing. I cannot tell if I am dreaming. Perhaps I never was. When I step up to the stage, I expect the world to shift. I expect my bedroom and the choke of sheets and sweat. Instead, I hear the creak of my foot resting on the floorboards. The theatre has accepted my entrance, allowed me into its mouth. And I know what I must do. I must prove my worth. I must give myself to this theatre, whole and unceasingly. I must perform. And so I do. I can't tell you what I do in those minutes or hours words, the movements, the notes come from the hollow in my chest, the ring in my bones. The floor beneath my feet feeds me an energy I have never felt before. I feel it. The theatre, its wood, is so old, has seen so many feet. It remembers every step, every drop of sweat and rosin. But it has never felt a love like mine. As I straighten from my bow, I take a breath to steady myself, 
to step forward and thank the non-existent crowd for their support. I take a breath. It aches. I feel my chest expand. It keeps going. All of a sudden, my lungs are filled with air. It's enough, enough, and then they continue to swell. My ribs are expanding, widening and lengthening to support the space my oversized lungs must take up. It is as if my chest is adamant to consume the entire space of the theatre. A final taste of the crowd, the wood, the light, held deep inside where it might sustain me the rest of my living days. An afterburn of burning lights and velvet and sweat. But I continue. I grow like a balloon swelling up with helium, like a creature nestled between my lungs, which has lain dormant, now pushing against my organs, attempting to escape. I look down at my chest and I am unsure what to expect swollen skin, a clawed hand pushing against the membrane, the jut of ribs like shadowed jaws of teeth consuming my heart, some sign of the strange, achingly painful extrapolation my body or soul is undertaking. There is nothing. My body is my body is my body, untouched. Its wood is as it has always been, varnished and smooth. Its velvet pools from the ceiling like waterfalls. There is a memory of something that might have been flesh, but it is unimportant. It is not a body of consequence. And thus, you find me, the ghost of this theatre. In the beams and rafters, I feel my ribs. In the foundations, dug deep into the earth among rocks and bones and roots, I feel my two feet planted firmly against the ground. In the ghost light's burning embers, I feel my soul still expanding. In the sets of doors between the stage and the street outside, I feel my arms thrown wide to welcome the audience to our performance. Each seat is a tooth for them to perch on inside my grinning mouth. The red curtain split wide as my lips to reveal the tongue to the teeth. And on my tongue, they used to dance. No one has danced upon my tongue in years, nor have they walked between my teeth. I don't... I can't remember quite when they stopped coming. Did I... Was it me who scared them away? Time is different when one is so achingly cavernous, measured by the breath you no longer take, the beats of a wood and velvet heart. No one has walked here in years. So why are you here? Do you want to open my doors and let back in the air? Do you want to dance upon my stage to an audience of one? Do you hear my voice in the creak of floorboards and lights? Do you know how to set me free? Ah. The fun of professional theatre. Don't you just love being so in love with your art that you become it? And don't you just love the ageist patriarchal structure we exist in still? <sighs> kind of a mood, that one. Wouldn't mind if my soul possessed the theatre. Maybe after I died, though, instead of whatever horror movie nonsense that was. A bit like the ghost one a while back sentient rooms. I wish I knew if these were all from the same plot line. I wish I could talk to this author person. I get the feeling they jumped me if I tried performing their work in public. Nix? Nix? Are you in there? 
Nix, let me in. I'm having a breakdown and you are the only person I can find who seems to be available. Hey, Lola, make yourself at home. Also, I don't think forcing me to answer the door before you break it down counts as being available. How did you even get into my house? Eh, Sam let me in. I tried texting, but Bella's at the library and you weren't answering your phone. And I'm hardly going to trek halfway across London just to find out Seth is in SA hell. Right, so you didn't actually check if I was the only one free. You're always free. Just because drama doesn't look like work to you doesn't mean I'm not busy. So you want me to leave? You'd turn me out in my hour of need, throw me to the streets like some Dickensian villain? (sighs) Fine. You get five minutes. Thank you. I owe you my life. Wait until I give the advice before you start offering payment for it. I can't guarantee it'll be worth more than, like, an arm or a leg on the black market. Do those have a lot of worth? Wouldn't you like to know? Anyway, what's up? Oh, I am having an absolute day. The barista at my trial shift this morning was way too hot and I can't handle it. I can't even remember if I introduced myself. I was just blue screening completely. A travesty, truly. Exactly. And I'm so helpful in this situation because of what? My expert dating skills? At least ask one of the friends you have who's actually attracted to people, you know, like that. Well, Bella's idea of flirting is staring longingly at someone for years without making a move. And Seth's idea of flirting is everyone just falling effortlessly in love with him without him even doing anything. Like I said, what do I bring to the table that those expert plans don't already provide? I don't know. Give me, like, the extrovert's version of Bella, I guess. You're not really being very supportive here, Nixie. I don't stare longingly at people for years without making a move. Oh, you don't? I'm sorry. I must have been watching a different eight-season slow burn Friends to Lovers plotline. You know, the one happening right before our eyes. Hmm? Okay. I came here to talk about my drama, and we'll definitely get back to that in a moment. But please... You, both of you, have been avoiding this subject for months now, and I can't take it another minute. You guys are living together now. You've been living together for six months. Have you talked? Have you made a move? Or is it just more of the cute, and by cute I mean painful, dancing around each other that will literally make me jump off a cliff someday? I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. Sure. And I'm mentally stable and on my way to Oxbridge next year. Shove off, Nixie. You've never been able to lie to me. I... Look, nothing's happened and nothing will happen. Why not? You like her, she likes you. Two plus two equals heart I squared. What the hell else is there? We're friends, lols. And I like that. And I'd rather have a friend than a fleeting romance followed by decades of distance, broken only at weddings and funerals. That is so incredibly morbid. I'm a child of divorce. Can't really help it. True love doesn't exist. Everything has a shelf life. Blah, blah, blah. You know? Nix, that is genuinely so depressing. You know you can't start anything if you've already got one foot out the door, right? And true love isn't for everyone. Some people are just looking for a good time or looking to feel something. You've never done anything, and that's valid if that's your thing. But you, you specifically, Nix. I know you don't like most people in that way, but you do like Bella. And both of you have never dated anyone else because you're too busy staring at each other and doing nothing at all. Look... If that's what it takes to make sure I never ruin things, I'm fine by that. What makes you so certain you'd ruin things? Experience. Nix? I don't know. Change is scary and stuff, you know? Especially when everything is always changing. But not us. It's safe. And it's comfortable. (sighs) You're actually terrible, you know, for putting me and Seth through this. I've had 20 quid riding on you guys since year 11. Is our future happiness really only worth 20 quid? That was a lot when we were 16, thank you very much. 
You know, maybe I should wrangle it up to 50 due to inflation or something. You seem very confident in your side of the bargain. If I have to play matchmaker to rig this bet, I am more than happy to do so. I might literally set fire to my eyeballs if I have to watch this for much longer. Look, even if I was going to do anything, which I'm not, it's not like I'm going to ask her on a date while we're still living together, am I? That's like rule one of uni. Don't shit where you eat. That's a rule for, like, freshers who've only just met, who are stuck in halls together for the next nine months, and will realise they hate each other the first time one of them leaves dirty plates in the sink, or put something grim in the shared bathroom. Not for people who've had chemistry for so many years they put the science department to shame. Okay, well, we're all so busy right now. Uh, we're performing Midsummer in a couple months, so I'm swamped with rehearsals. And Bella has at least three essays she's stressed as hell about. You're always going to be stressed, Nix. You were stressed at GCSEs, you were stressed at A-levels, you're stressed at uni. You're going to be stressed at starting a new job and starting new projects and trying to get promotions. And before you know it, you'll be 30 and haven't spoken in half a decade. And you were calling me morbid? I feel like this is something you thought way too much about. Maybe we should be having that conversation instead? We're not here to talk about me. Yes, we are. Wait, did you make up the cute barista just to trick me into talking about Bella? No, there really is a cute barista, and I am very much head over heels. Pretty sure I messed up any chance at getting the job because of it. But that is not the point, and you're avoiding the subject. And maybe this barista has been an ongoing disaster for the last few weeks, since I am a regular at the shop, and is therefore not as urgent as I made them sound. But again, not the point here. You're the one who skipped out on coffee this weekend. How else am I supposed to get my regular fix of the Nixon Bella show? I feel like I should be getting a cut of your 20 quid at this point. I would give you the whole damn 20 quid if I thought it would do any good. I don't... I don't like seeing you guys so... needlessly unhappy. You know she likes you too. Right? Yes. Yes, okay. I know Bella likes me. She knows I like her. We'd have to be completely oblivious not to notice. I mean... Don't finish that sentence. Okay, okay. But we do know. We've known for ages. We just... Neither of us is going to, like, do anything. Because why would we? I'm a mess. I'm worse than a mess. How can I ask her to deal with that? How am I supposed to look after her the way she deserves when I can't even remember to brush my teeth every day? How could I love her when I can't even like myself half the time? Have you ever actually talked to Bella about this? Have you actually explained why you won't ask her out? Or asked her why she won't ask you? Well, no, but... Have you noticed that you're already both joined at the hip? What would actually change about your friendship if you started dating? Don't you already buy her flowers and cook for her and sleep in her bed sometimes and stare longingly at her when you think she isn't looking? Don't you already put her first? And yeah, maybe it isn't that healthy, and you really do need to like yourself, but whoever said you need to love yourself in order to love someone else was lying. And have you ever considered that maybe the sheer amount of anxiety you have about all this is, like, bad for you? That maybe you need to clear the air? I'm allowed to be scared, aren't I? I've... I've never dated anyone before. I've never felt this way about 
anyone else. Being ace is hard enough, was hard enough, when I thought I was aromantic too. And then, one day, I woke up and it was like the floor had fallen away from my feet. Like someone had wrapped a hand around my heart and squeezed or poured butterflies down my throat while I slept. And I've been falling ever since. I don't believe in love, not romantic love. I don't believe it lasts. From the moment it starts, there's a timer. And before you know it, the sands have slipped through your fingers and you're left with just the memories of better times. And even those are hollow because you know what came after. I saw it with my parents. They were so in love when I was younger. They were best friends as well as partners. And maybe it's just me romanticizing it, but I never saw it coming. One moment they were dancing in the kitchen to dream a little dream, and the next they weren't talking and refused to be in the same room together. Friendship is stable and concrete. It lasts and it isn't hurtling towards a lifetime of milestones like marriage and house and kids or decaying into hatred. It's just mutual love with no strings attached. And so liking Bella romantically, it's the most terrifying thing that's ever happened to me. I'm sorry, that was a... No, it's okay. I, well, I can't say that I get it. My dad's a true romantics. They hardly fight. And when they do, they always make sure to keep it away from me and my brothers. They always taught me to dream about love in whatever form I wanted it or found it. I can't imagine what that must have been like for you. I'm sorry. It's not your... No, but I'm sorry for you. I wish your parents had let you grow up believing in love, even if they didn't themselves. I wish they'd put you first. Thanks. I just wish you knew you deserved to be happy. I am happy, though. I get to be friends with Bella. I'm already so lucky. I get to be friends with you and Seth. What more could I ask for? Well... We are very great people to be friends with. Yes, you are, oh modest one. Modesty is for people who don't know how brilliant they are. And like I said, I do know how brilliant I am. That's another one of the tricks my dad's taught me. The best kind of love is the love you give yourself. Your dad sounds like they run an inspirational quotes account on Instagram. I can neither confirm or deny those rumours. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Say, say I was going to believe you for a second. That everything wouldn't immediately go wrong. Say, I was going to try, <laughs> try, Lola, just hypothetically. What, what would I do? I don't know, Nix. You're the one who has to ask. You know her the best out of anyone alive. You've got to figure out how you want to do this. Would you prefer dinner and a movie and then pop the question? Or wandering the park at dusk? Or whilst you're watching Much Ado About Nothing for the hundredth time on the couch? Think about it like you're directing a play. There's so many stages and so many scripts. You've got to pick what vibes with you best. All the world to stage. Exactly! What would the bard do? Compose a sonnet about her that's performed on stage to hundreds of people? Anything a bit more achievable? Maybe? I... I don't know. I need to, like, think about it. A lot. Before I get ahead of myself and just blurt it out over breakfast. 
I truly don't know how you've managed not to do that this whole time. A potent mixture of fear and self-hatred. Nix, please find a new therapist before I have to send you to my father. I'm not seeing your father. Yes, please don't. It's bad enough having a therapist in the house 24-7. I don't need him knowing everything from your point of view, too. I, I'm no snitch. Well, then, find a therapist. Or it's psychology time with Dr. Brodeur. And you never know what he can get out of you with his mind games. Fine, fine. Just force me into healthy habits and communication, why don't you? You're welcome. I hate you. Love you too. <sighs> now tell me about this barista. Okay. So, they're one of the baristas at the Caramel and Clove. Not Ambrose, right? What? Ew! No! He's like 30. And Bella's dad, basically. I don't know. Maybe you're into Dilfs these days. Please never open your mouth again. Only if you get to the good stuff soon. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I've got to set the scene, you know. Hang on. You applied for a job at the Caramel and Clove? Did I know this? I don't think I knew this. No, I just didn't want to say anything in case it made things awkward. When do you hear back? I have my second trial shift this evening. And Maisie is working. Well... If you got a second trial shift, it must have gone better than you think, right? Maybe. So, Maisie, this is the barista? Of course. Nix, you literally live in that place. How do you not know them? I don't know. It always seems to be Ambrose working when I'm in there. Well then, let me tell you about Maisie. They're... Ugh. Oh, wait... Thank you so much for listening to the Attic Monologues. If you're enjoying our show, please consider supporting us through our Patreon or Ko-fi to help us compensate the hard work our team puts into every episode. You can find links in the show notes below. Alternately, you can leave us a review or tell a friend, an enemy, or your oblivious love interest to listen. This episode was written and produced by Morgan Greensmith. It was directed and script edited by Ellen Clehesi. The sound design was by Anna Leclerc, and the theme tune was composed by Wilkie Morrison. In this episode, you heard the voices of Atlas Morgan as Nix Ryland, Roya Garby as Lola Brodeur. The logo was designed by Ailey Lang. The social media is run by Soren Browood. You can find us on Twitter at Attic Monologues and on Instagram, Tumblr, Facebook, and TikTok at The Attic Monologues. For more information on our show, our crew, our policies, or other shows made by our people, check out our website, www.planarprod.com. Episode 19, All the World's a Stage, will be out on November 30th. See you then! Interest though, just spam mail. Shit. Today's episode features a trailer for Ritualistic Podcast, a bi weekly horror thriller podcast following an archaeology student and her team as they excavate an old church. With whispered voices, creepy visions, and just a little bit of human sacrifice, we know fans of the Attic Monologues will love this show. So without further ado, Ritualistic. Hello, listeners. It is my grave duty to report to you that Jamie Locke's complete tapes have been discovered, and they're worse than we thought. Mr. Arthur has her in his hands yet, and the others, they're all in grave danger. Her reports on the strangeness in Middleton, Ohio, I cannot describe them in my own words. Should you think you can do something to save the Melody Method dig site crew, tune into Ritualistic Podcast on Spotify. New episodes come out every other Wednesday. And remember, listeners, join the Blinding Melody Church today.